My name is Danny Shannon, and I'm with Information Strategies. I was the project manager and a senior business analyst for both of the SAVIN implementation projects we've done with the states of Indiana and South Dakota. A little bit about InfoStrat. Uh, we've been in business for about 30 years. Uh, Microsoft Gold Partner in Microsoft Dynamics CRM and SharePoint. Uh, Savin was uh, built using Dynamics CRM, uh, and so that was kind of how we came into this. Uh, we've been a, a Microsoft Gold Partner for a long time and have won many awards from Microsoft, uh, including Federal Partner of the Year several times. When we first implemented uh, Savin in uh, state of Indiana, we had certain goals we were trying to achieve. Um, going through those real quickly. Uh, basically, we wanted to be able to serve victims better at a lower cost. So we looked at how things were done under the, the present system and made some, some changes to, to basically allow us to personalize the process of notification, uh, provide more options for notification, as well as how those options could be used. Uh, and, and basically using cloud services and various other technologies essentially improve the process, provide better service, and do it uh, more cheaply than uh, what they were paying currently at that time. Uh, one of the key focus areas also was we wanted to reduce the notification latency. That is the time between the time that uh, an event occurred and the time that the notification would occur. Um, basically using the old methodology of essentially large data dumps uh, and updates coming all at once, being held for a while, and then basically coming all at once. Uh, what we wanted to do was go towards a more what we call transactional approach, where when that data were entered into the source system uh, regarding a booking, regarding a release, regarding a court case, um, to basically have the source system send that data right away as a single transaction on that that event, and then we could start the notification process uh, immediately. And so what we've done is we've been able to reduce that latency to somewhere around a couple of minutes uh, for most types of events. Again, we wanted to be smart about this, so certain things didn't need to be uh, sent, you know, sent notifications right away, uh, and so we could prioritize the, the notification schema as well. Um, one of the other things we wanted to do was make it a standard feature to follow the offender through the justice life cycle. What that means is we keep one record on an offender. A person can only be in one place at a time, uh, and so we thought that the system should reflect that. And so when a, 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 an offender is booked in one jail and then moved to another jail, maybe gets released and booked, released and booked, we're following them through. And so if you've signed up for notifications in one of those, you know, locations, we, we will provide you notifications when they are booked again, released again, uh, any court case information that has been uh, provided concerning that person, and then if they get uh, convicted, sentenced to prison, follow them into the prison, into parole, probation, uh, through end of sentence, and then if they violate parole, violate probation, or come back into the system, basically continue that notification process for that uh, victim. Uh, and so we, we basically provide full justice life cycle uh, notifications. So it's sign up once and you're, you're basically getting a continuum of notifications so long as that person remains in the justice system. Uh, we want to provide a flex flexible and personalized notification so that what we do is we categorize notification types and then give the victim a lot of different options as to how they can be notified based on those categorizations. I'm going to cover this a little bit later when we actually get into the demo portion, and so uh, I won't go into that too much now. Uh, improve the data correctness. One of the things that uh, has been a problem traditionally with uh, victim notification systems, and with any kind of a notification system, is that data in. Uh, a lot of times the source system can be old, they may not have the best data quality, uh, and you get a lot of varying data. We've seen things where somebody goes and does some cleanup in one of the source systems and suddenly a blast of you know, hundreds and thousands of records that may or may not be accurate uh, come across. So one of the things we wanted to do was find a, a set of governors and, and protecting devices to validate the data, make sure it, it makes sense 
uh, under the current circumstances and provide means for dealing with bad data. Uh, in addition to that, we wanted to provide enhanced program management. There's a lot of things that SAVN administrators should be able to do without having to come to me uh, or to whatever service provider and have them make those changes. Uh, so we set up a, a series of runtime values, uh, things that uh, can be done quickly without a lot of additional uh, activity on our part that uh, you can do to, to basically change slightly or significantly the way that Savin operates, whether it's that cycle of phone calls, whether it's just the message text, uh, things like that. So we provide a, 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 a set of tools for the uh, Savin administrator to um, manage that process and, and, and make it more what they want it to be. Uh, in addition to that, just basically ownership of the data. This is the, the state's data. From our standpoint, we are not interested in taking that data, packaging it up some other way, and selling it for other products. It's your data. You do with it what you want. Uh, you retain it, and, and it, it, it remains on your system for as long as you desire or, or need it. Um, finally, the expansibility aspect. So we were bringing in data from all different sources, from jails, from prisons, probation offices, courts, uh, prosecution offices, and so forth. Uh, and we wanted to be able to take that data and use it for other state purposes as well. Uh, and if time permits, I can go into uh, some of those. Uh, as well. So SAVN basically comes in two components. There's the uh, external facing portal that is a public portal. This is available for anybody to go in, do offender searches, uh, set up their own accounts, set up uh, request notifications and so forth. Uh, we've done some expansion of the portal so there's some specialty portals in it as well. Uh, I will cover uh, a little bit of that as we go, uh, but this provides for people like law enforcement officers, uh, state's attorneys or district attorneys or, or you know, state prosecutors uh, to, uh, or county prosecutors to, to go in and, and essentially do additional things within SAV and that uh, we think are appropriate for them. Um, I've got a demo version set up. It's at the URL that you see here, so you can kind of go and, and play with, uh, with that if you like. There's also the core administration tool, which is built in dynamic CRM, uh, and that is where the SAVN administrator would spend uh, the majority of their time going in and kind of monitoring and, and basically managing the, the notification process and uh, tracking how it's going. That core technology, like I said, is dynamic CRM, and uh, we chose CRM for a number of reasons. First of all, we are a gold partner with CRM, and we found that it's a, a rapid development engine for us. Uh, it's easy to use for the end users, uh, so it's got a nice web interface uh, that looks and, and, and feels a lot like uh, various Microsoft Office products, so there's that familiarity with it. Um, but for us, we found that it's easy to develop in. It provides a lot of out-of-the-box capabilities that an Apple, uh, or excuse me, enable rapid development. Um, you can customize through the uh, interface itself uh, by configuration uh, without doing a lot of uh, custom coding. Uh, it's got a built-in workflow engine, and it's also got a set of templates uh, that can be used for um, things like emails, mail merges, things like that. Uh, it also integrates very seamlessly with Microsoft Office. Uh, there's actually an Outlook plugin that you can use and, and operate all of, essentially, Savin uh, from within Outlook. Uh, it integrates with Exchange so that the emails would be coming basically from your state servers, would have that you know, .gov um, uh, in their email address, and so usually that, that gets it by uh, pretty much most of the spam filters and so forth. They usually let .gov uh, emails come through. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there's the you know Excel and Word integration uh, where you can export and data to Excel, import data from Excel, uh, and you can also do mail merges in Word. Finally, it's got SharePoint integration where you can use SharePoint for document management for things like uh, offender images or other documents. Uh, I know in Indiana they use it for sex offender release processing from the prisons, and so a lot of the Shepherd's reports and things like that get stored as well. Um, 
It's got some built-in uh, out-of-the-box features that are really helpful, things like dashboards and charts, uh, a wide range of search capabilities. Um, you also can set up your own personal views and do ad hoc reporting. Uh, so you can essentially pretty much generate your own report uh, as, as, you know, with the, the queries that you need uh, to find out what's going on in the system or get historic uh, information. Uh, it's also got a built-in security model uh, that is uh, very granular very uh, and provides for what we call role-based security so that people can see into the system in the manner that's appropriate for the role they play. Uh, I wasn't planning on going too deep into this. Uh, I can if there's questions on it or if somebody wants to do a follow-up discussion later. Uh, finally, there's an application interface for external integration that enables easy data exchange with external systems. Uh, and that's what we leverage for like the uh, SAVIN IEPD, for the, the NEEM standard uh, data interface, uh, and as well as other uh, web service type interfaces and batch interfaces. With that, I'm going to jump into the demo. And uh, again, we'll uh, ask questions. This is the, the outward facing portal. Uh, did everybody get the uh, URL? If not, let me jump back and I'll just copy and paste that into the uh, chat. So I pasted the, the portal URL into the chat if others want to join in as well. So the basic idea here is to, uh, again, have an emphasis on what we call transaction data. Transaction data basically, like I said, means when an event gets recorded in the uh, system of record, that data is sent what's called, uh, via what, uh, what's called a web service, uh, direct data exchange right to Savin, so we have that data almost immediately. Um, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, we're going we're gonna to book an offender. So can somebody give me the name of, of an offender they would like us to book? So I like to, to kind of operate without a net here uh, so that you know we're actually doing this in real time. Yeah, so I guess put it on a question or a chat window or... Okay. Han Solo. All right. So let's, let's search and make sure Han's not in there already. I'm going to do an offender search, and I'm going to search on Han Solo. Okay, notice I get no results. Okay, um, I'm also just going to go into Dynamic CRM, and I'm going to do an offender search there and make sure he's not in the system and just not listed for do not display. And I'll explain that a little bit later. All right, so we don't have a Han Solo. All right, uh, so Benson, if you would, go ahead and uh, Benson is going to act like a jail and court system, so he's going to go ahead and send me data on Han Solo. All right, so he has sent it. We'll do a search, and there's Han Solo, and he's in custody at Pennington County Jail. All right, I go back to Dynamic CRM and I search again. Oops, there he is. So I have a record for him in in CRM that's basically being presented in the portal. All right, Benton uh, will also send some court data and uh, hearing data about uh, Han Solo so that we have some additional data that we can look at in the details. I do the search and then I can click on the details and get some additional information. Once Benson sends the hearing information, that hearing will show up in here as well. So. All right. Just wanted to. I'm going to 
jump to another site real quick. Uh, just to show you a slightly different uh, take, this is the Indiana development site. And I'm just going to do a quick offender search here as well. Uh, and show you, again, I get somewhat different table. And on that table, I get, when I go into the details as well, I can get different information as well. So you can decide what information you want to display on that uh, particular offender out on the portal. Uh, for your specific uh, implementation. All right. Oh. All right, so here's Hansolo. Now, if I want to register for Hansolo, and I'm going to let uh, all of you, if you would like, uh, go ahead and register as well uh, so that you can get notifications as well. When you click to register, uh, one of the things we ask is that you set up an account. Uh, and that way, we'll have various data available for you and we can do things like notification failover if we fail to reach you by one method on a notification because your phone's out of order or whatnot. We have other options to try to reach you. So I'm going to register for an account. All right. And I'm going to register and basically provide a username. You can give any name you want. Don't use the same name I'm about to use. Um, so I'm going to go in as falling duck. Okay. Enter a password. Okay. Uh, with the security question, you can make up your own security question and answer. And then that can be used to help you if you need to um, if you forget your, your password or so forth, we, we have a security question we can ask you. Okay. And I'm gonna go in as Tedwin Mulrose. All right, and it's 123 4th Street in Washington, D.C. And then I will put in an email address. All right. A phone number. And I'll use that for text as well. And then I can specify whether I want English or Spanish notifications. All right. Um, in, in this particular implementation, the email is already in use and the phone number is already in use. So uh, we don't want to create duplicates. So I'm going to have to use something else. So I'll have to use my Gmail. Actually, that's probably already used too. So, and uh, yeah. this is why nobody would ever hire me to do data entry. Oh. All right. So now I've created an account. And then what's going to do is going to take me back to that registration page for the offender. So all right. And it gives me my notification options. Now, in the South Dakota implementation, uh, the way we structured it, uh, according to state rules, is you can sign up as an interested party and only get emails. Uh, you can sign up as a victim. And if you sign up as a victim, then you're offered additional uh, notification options, phones, text, letters. Uh, but you have to be approved by a state's attorney as a victim. So there's a vetting process that takes place uh, and register. And then what's going to happen is a task is going to get created uh, in the system for the state's attorney to basically check and make sure that I am a victim and identify the case with which I am the victim. Okay. 
just to show you again the variances, let me jump back to the Indiana system real quick. Okay, and I'll go ahead and register, and in this case, I'm just going to use an account I've already got. Okay. I automatically just have options to all the, the different notification types. And again, this is a, what we've done is we've designed a system so that the notification types are um, appropriate for the ur urgency level of the type of event. So emergency events, we I talked about those categories. We have four, emergency, urgent, priority, and routine. Emergency means the person is out of custody and uh, we didn't have any opportunity to let you know that was going to happen. So things like an escape, case overturned, uh, things like that. Urgent is the person has uh, is no longer in custody, but we knew that was happening. So, for instance, somebody in a prison is going to have a, a planned release date. That date came, so we're letting you know he's out. So we do that as an urgent. Still want to let you know that it happened. Uh, we've also done what we call advanced notifications where we've told you, you know, X days out, Y days out, that this was coming. Priority is for time-oriented events, things like hearings, uh, where um, there's some, if you will, urgency to let you know, but it's usually more than a week out. Uh, so if we don't get that notification to you 10 minutes ago, that's probably OK. And then routine are things like movements from one facility to another where the person's never been out of custody. Uh, and so the, the, there's going to be a lag on that. And, and in some cases, we actually program in a lag so that <coughs> excuse me, the, uh, we're not putting any law enforcement people at risk who might be transiting that person from one facility to the next. All right. So I'm going to go in now. I've asked to be a victim. And I'm going to go in and deal with the, the task. I go to a queue. That's the state's attorney queue. And we built the state's attorney portal. OK, I've got two of them. So somebody else wanted to be a victim, too. So I'll go ahead and prove this person. All right, again, in order to be a <clears throat> victim, you need to be associated with a case in this particular implementation. Uh, I'm going to approve you, and I'm going to mark it complete. And I'm going to thank you for willing to be a, a guinea pig in this experiment. And I'm going to do the same thing for the person I registered for. So now, when I go into the details, now I'm a victim. And I've got more notification options, just the same way. Um, as I was explaining earlier, we categorize and then we provide options of notification that are appropriate for that type of event. So letters don't make sense for emergency and urgent type events. Phone calls to, to limit the, the, the call volume to those things that really need to be done. Um, what we've done is basically said we're not going to do phone calls as part of priority and routine op items. Uh, unless it's as like a failover, okay, where we failed to notify by some other way, so the email bounced back or something like that. Um, all right. Now, one of the other things that we do in, in Seven to make life simpler for the victim is once I've registered for somebody, I never have to search again. I log in, I go to my offender notifications, and there's the list of people I've not, uh, registered for. And then I can modify my notification scheme as appropriate. OK. So let's say I want to add somebody else to the notification scheme. Well, let me do another search. And I'm going to search for my neighbor, Donnie Cadwell. And I can do a partial name search here, or a full name search. And I don't get any results. Well, I know I saw the police pick him up yesterday. 
So what happened with that? Well, let me go look and see. And I'll go into 7. All right, so he's in the system. So I'm going to open up his record. I just wanted to show uh, uh, this upper section here to you on the record. We basically have some logic within uh, the, the solution so that we can prevent display on the portal, we can prevent registration on the portal, and we can prevent notification as the situation uh, requires. In this particular case in, in South Dakota, only people who have committed certain crimes or are charged with certain crimes are basically eligible for notification purposes. So if I look at his most serious offense, his most serious offense is accumulation of dog manure. Okay? Kind of probably the only victim there is the dog uh, in this case. So um, we're going to mark him as do not display. Somebody that had a, you know, more like an abuse type of, of charge or something like that would be displayed on the portal. So if we look at Han Solo's record, um, Let's go back to the offender list and I can actually. Okay. We see that he was charged with uh, assault, simple assault. That is a SAVIN qualified offense, as we call it. And so he's displayed. We can register for him uh, and we'll provide notifications. So uh, one of the reasons for maybe do not register is. For instance, if somebody were to, somebody famous were to be you know, booked or whatnot, and we don't want to just provide notifications to the entire world because they're interested in what so and so is doing. Things like that. All right. So he doesn't show up, but okay, how about my cousin? And that's Tom Cassell. So Thomas Cassell, he does show up. He's currently under supervision, meaning it's parole or probation. So I can go ahead and register for him as well. And I'll just register as an interested party. So again, once I've registered, that goes into my offender notifications list. So again, I, know I don't have to search on those guys, and I can get the most current status just by going to my offender notification. All right. Let's see. I'm going to log out, and then I'm going to log back in. Oops. Helps to complete the process. Some, uh, we, what, one of the things we've done built in the public portal are what we call specialty portals. So there's a, a state attorney portal, and there's a law enforcement portal as well. And these are used for um, basically the, the justice uh, officials in the different counties. And so when I, I sign up, I'll go into my profile, and I can request to be listed as a state's attorney with, say, Aurora, so forth, a particular county, a particular agency, here's my ID number, and so forth. And then there's an approval process. Once I'm approved, then I'll have various permissions in the system. So I can get a report um, you know, and, and do proxy registrations. And that's one of the things I wanted to show you was the proxy registration. So I'm going to sign up. I'm going to go look up Han Solo. And now as a state's attorney, oops, did I spell something wrong? There he is. Helps to spell things correctly. As a state's attorney, I now have an extra button here called proxy. And I can basically do what's called a proxy registration. And that is I can sign someone else up for notification. Uh, when I do it as a state's attorney, then uh, I can auto basically make that person automatically approved as a victim. All right. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, if I've already got proxy registrations, that I've set up for Han Solo, then I can modify them and they would show up in the list here. Otherwise, I'll just add a new registrant. All right, and then I can specify, as a state's attorney, I can specify what type of proxy I want to set up. So a general 
basically means I'm signing you up, but you're going to manage the account from here. So you just happen to be in my office. You say, I'd like to get a notification. All right, I'll sign you up. I'll use the proxy system. Uh, and then it's basically your account from there. Temporary is for someone that's in temporary uh, circumstances, like a, a battered woman's shelter or something like that, where they may not have access to their normal methods of communication. Uh, and so when I set it up as a, a temporary, then what we can do is notify the shelter, and the shelter will pass the information on to that person. And finally, I can uh, register somebody as full. And, and what full proxy means is the system will notify me as the state's attorney, and I will notify the victim. Okay? So again, it's just a, a, an additional set of features that are available. Same thing. I'll specify the, uh, the list of cases associated with Han Solo would be listed. I'll pick the case that this person's associated with, enter their victim ID from my system, and then basically create a user account and contact information for them. And again, typically it would use my, it's going to contact me for that person. All right, I'm going to jump out of that part uh, at this point. In addition to that, uh, there's the law enforcement portal, and I'm going to log out. And then I'm going to log in as a law enforcement user. All right. With the law enforcement user, I also can do proxy registration, but I only have the general option. I don't have the uh, temporary and the uh, full option. Uh, and again, that's just uh, the way it was implemented here for, for South Dakota. We can do things differently if you wanted to do something different as well. So it's not like you're forced into this schema. And that's one of the things I really want to, to stress. Um, the whole point of this is to be flexible. Each state has a different way of doing things. And so we can basically modify this solution to work the way you would want to work. All right. As a law enforcement portal, when I click on the law enforcement, again, I have certain reports uh, and things I can, I can use. The one I wanted to show you, this is, is uh, one of the, the situations we see a lot in the, in the Savin universe, uh, victim notification universe, are jails that are out or not integrated. Uh, and so this provides a set of tools where a jail that is not integrated or a jail that is down can still manage their, constitu uh, excuse me, their offender list from the portal. So they've sent data over on these people, um, and then they can do a release on somebody that's booked into their system or are booked in or add a new offender, like a new booking. Okay, and again, when I do an add offender, I have to specify the charge. It has to be one of those seven reportable charges, or we're not gonna not gonna let them do it. We're not gonna let them enter the person because we're only supporting. In this case, we're only supporting those seven charges. Uh, to extend this, it would be easy to simply say allow all charges and just pick from those um, and add like a custom charge for. Uh, local charges as well, if you wanted to make it a more open system. Uh, specify the offender number, the custody status time, uh, and then basically we would add the offender data from there. So, again, different features for the different types of, of justice users. All right, and with that, I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start doing some notification activity. So, Han Solo is currently in custody at Pennington County Jail. All right, so Benson, if you would, go ahead and act like the jail again and release them. All right, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to do, actually, I don't need to search again. I can go to my offender notifications. Oh, let me log back in as. Um, The duck. What do I call it? Falling duck. All right. I go to my offender notifications. All right. Notice Han Solo is now out of custody. Okay, and he was released today. Again, I can go look at his record in the system as well. And I'm just going to refresh this. All right, again, he's released from Pennington County. I can scroll down and look at the details at 723 this morning. Okay, 
So when that happens now, those of us who have registered for notification should start getting emails and texts and phone calls. Now the phone call will go to a phone call queue. And all right, so Benson came through. Again, so this is, oops, got a phone call. Make sure I go to the right place. So this is uh, basically a phone that will show up in the phone queue. Keep clicking the wrong thing. All right. This is what a phone call would look like. Okay, um, and so essentially what we do is provide a phone script and the call center operator would simply read through the script and then basically say this form you that Han Solo was immediately released from custody on such, such a day from this Pennington County Jail. That release was released on the cognizance. All right, so the call center operator would say, okay, I answered it. Mark it complete. If we did something other than answer it, then we'd cycle through um, a series of phone calls uh, based on the, the schema that you want to use. Oh, looks like others are coming in now too. So there's uh, G. Monet and Tedwin Mulrose. So those phone calls came through as well. And there we go, down here. All right, so G. Monet, you should have received a text and a phone call, or excuse me, and an email. Oh, it looks like she may have left. Yes. Okay. All right. So I guess uh, we're going to have her share that with us, but okay. All right, so that's, that's basically, again, the notification scheme. We'll get uh, additional notifications as we move this guy through. He's going to get booked again in a, a little bit. Um, but again, I talked about that single offender record. Benson, if you want, go ahead and, and send a new booking record for a different jail for Han Solo. And so I'll go ahead and do my search on Han Solo again. Oops. Or I could have stayed in the My Offender Notification. Notice now he's in custody at a different jail. So he's been booked into a separate jail. It's that same record. So when I go back to CRM and I look at the offender record, Okay, notice he's now in Beetle County Jail in custody. All right, and the same thing, there'll be a set of notifications. All right, called the return to custody. Okay, and so basically, like I said, we're following this single offender through the entire justice life cycle. All right, so that would be, again, we sent, we got a, a pretty good match. Um, Sometimes, however, people fat finger things, and uh, we get uh, data that doesn't quite match. We do what's called a partial match. So we have kind of a, a interesting um, what we call a matching logic. Uh, we have what's called an upper threshold. We use multiple data points, and basically have an upper threshold and a lower threshold. If you're above the upper threshold, we match that record right away. If you're below that threshold, we're just going to create a new record. If you're between the two thresholds, we're going to create a new record, but we're also going to create a task to say this might be the same person as that. Uh, so Benson, if you would, go ahead and send me a partial match feed. All right. And when that happens, I'm going to get a task here. It's called possible duplicate offender record. 
when I open that up, it's going to basically say, okay, there's a, a record that may be duplicated. Here's Han Solo, born 12-23-1982. Okay, and I'm going to go to this regarding, which is the data feed record. And I'm going to see they created a Han Solomon. Okay, so that may be the same person. It may not. I'll open up that record. And I'll see, okay, same date of birth. Uh, and again, multiple data points. We, you know, the more data points we get, the, the, the more sure we have the, the same match. If this, isn't, if, if this is not the same person, uh, then I would leave that record alone. But what I can do is I can reach out to the jail and find out, okay, is this the same person? And if so, I can select the two, and then I have the ability to merge those two records if they are the same person. Uh, so essentially, if it is that if that is the same person, I can basically recreate them as one record. Anybody that's been registered for the one will automatically be registered for the other one. All right. Some other um, areas that that we worked on uh, was specifically dealing with bad data. Uh, bad data can come in a multiple of forms, and so I'm going to look up Steve Eller. Okay, I'm just going to manually update his record. So just to make sure I have registered for him. Yes, I have. Okay. And so Steve is currently in custody. Today is his expected release date. So I'm going to say he's end of sentence. And that's today. And let's say it happened at 2 p.m. And I'll go here, set his release date. Again, normally this would be done by data feed. Um, I'm just doing this manually just because I'm picking somebody. All right, I can save it. And then what would happen is, oh, I should have set the, I set the date wrong. Bad me. Normally what I would do, and maybe I have somebody there already, uh, if I'd set it, say, say it happened on the 15th instead of today, okay, I would get what's called a backdate event. So that happened, you know, and again, I was saying is that basically this person was assigned to a custody status of in custody on 10-15, okay, and this was basically, I created this one I believe yesterday. Um, so that was more than a couple of days ago. A lot of times we see where we're getting data that is not, you know, from today, not from the last couple of days. So we want to be able to stop, take a look at it. Okay, so let me just look and see. All right, is this the right data? I can call the jail or, or the, the, the facility and say, is this accurate? Um, yeah, we just, you know, we forgot to mark him as, as released, okay, or mark him as, as in custody. If that's the case, all I have to do is click the restart uh, offender notification, and essentially what that will do is anybody that would have received notification will continue to will, will get that notification. But this also allows me, if I want, to go in and say I want to modify the email text a little bit and add uh, a little additional information. So say the reason you are getting this late is dot, dot, dot. And then when I send the notification, that information is included as well. And that way I can make adjustments uh, if it's backdated and so forth. So again, a nice feature. If we're telling somebody something that happened a little while ago, we at least can tell them why we're telling them that, uh, other than waiting for them to call and say, you know, why am I just getting this now? One of the other areas with the a single offender record is competing data. Uh, sometimes, for instance, we'll transfer from one jail to another. The first jail doesn't mark the person as out uh, before the other jail marks them as in. So, Benson, if you would, send me a, a booking conflict for Han Solo. All right, let me go back to Han Solo. All right, 
And so right now, Han Solo is in Beetle County, okay, because that's where he was before. And if I look on my dashboard, I have another um, task here that says, Aurora County Jail attempted to update offender currently in Beetle County Jail. Okay, so now I've got Beetle says they've got him. Aurora says we just got him. So what I can do is I can call Beetle Jail and say, did you guys move him over to Aurora County? They'll say, oh yeah, we just we haven't updated the, the data yet. So what I can do okay, um, is go to the task and basically say, okay, this is a approved facility change. We'll go ahead and, move and do that. Mark the task as complete. All right, and now when I search for Han Solo, and again we can do it here. All right, I'll just F5 the screen. Okay, now in custody at Aurora County Jail. All right, and then if I'm no, uh, if I'm registered for him, uh, and I've got routine notifications, then I will get a transfer notification for him as well. All right. Finally, every once in a while, one of the other things we see is somebody sends us data that you know, and, and, and specifies an event that we don't have configured in our system. Uh, so Benson, if you would, go ahead and, and send that not defined. Okay. All right, and now I've got a new task. I cleared out that other task. Now I have a new task that basically says I've got uh, an IEPD message with invalid data. So I can look and see who sent it to me. Okay, so it's a court event uh, in, in uh, the, this particular system. It's a centralized court system. Uh, otherwise, it would tell me, that, you know, I could put in here who sent it to me, which court specifically sent it to me. And I can contact the court system and say, what does event code ZZZZ mean? Uh, if it's a notifiable event, then I can go ahead and configure my solution to um, you know handle that that event and basically specify how it should be handled. And I'm going to talk to that in just a second. There's one other type of data issue that we see, and that's where somebody's doing some cleanup, and all of a sudden we get a bunch of records, um, you know, releasing a bunch of people that aren't really released. And so what we've done is we set up a notification governor. And what that does is that allows us to specify a threshold for each kind of event that we do notifications on. So as we get, you know, if we were to get a, a bunch of absconds in a short period of time, that might indicate that something's wrong. And so what we'll do is we'll stop notifications for that kind of event only uh, and say, and, and then create an alert. And we can go and we can look and see, okay, are these, re are these real? Um, abscons or did somebody you know clean out their parole system or something like that and, and send a bunch of dummy data over or bad data over uh, and that way we can prevent mass notification of error data if that's what is the case so for instance and again we do it by different type of, of event because each event is different and so you know 30 um, <clears throat> paroles in an hour Parole notification or, or parole messages in an hour is probably not a big deal, but 30 deaths in an hour—that's that may be indicating something's up. Um, and so we can stop notification for that kind of event, look and see, and then if everything's copacetic, then we go ahead and just re-enable re the the that particular event, and everything continues on. All right, and that kind of leads into this whole notion of make it your own system. One of the things we wanted to do with Sabin was to make it as easy as possible um, for you to manage your system, your messages, what you how you want it to work. There's no reason if you want to change the text of your uh, of a message for a, uh, a particular type of event that you need to ask me and wait for me to do it for you. Um, and so, for instance, if I want to change my abscond messages. I can go into the abscond event, we call it a notify rule, and I can essentially set up the different rules for it. So again, I specify the type, 
and abscond. I can specify a different notification level. So again, notice there's that same categorization. So I may want to change the category. Um, I can make it just a court event, a general notification event. And general notification means interested parties can get it. Court notification basically means it's something that would be uh, associated if you wanted court-only events and so forth. Uh, here's your governor settings. And then here's my messages. So for, for the different messages I'm going to specify, here's the text for phone, email, letters. Um, and this is basically the base text that gets used. So I open up this record, and here's the message. It gets sent for English. I can also do it. This is the message that would get sent for Spanish, uh, again, for phone, email, and letter. And then here's SMS message in English, and then there'll also be one SMS message in Spanish. And again, if we add new notification methods, okay, so you want to start doing IM, you want to start sending to Twitter or Facebook, uh, Facebook Messenger, something like that, you know, basically as long as there's an API that we can pass it to, then we could actually include that and set up messaging for those kinds of uh, media as well. All right. So that's the, the setting up the notification rules. In addition to that, we have what's called the IEPD event types. So IEP event types, these are the kinds of incoming messages I'm going to get, and what do I do with them? And again, we make this so you can configure it. You can add new ones. So for instance, I got that ZZZZZ. If I wanted, I could simply add a new ZZZZ event. OK, it's coming from the courts. What does this mean? Whatever they told me this means. OK. All right. And again, what kind of an event is it? Let's say it's a case event. Okay, if there's a specific notification type that I want to associate with it, so when I get one of these, I'll do a case appeal type of event. Or I can leave it alone and say, I'm just going to update the case record and let the natural processes flow from that. I can set a start and end date. So if it's after the end date when I get this, then I won't make any updates. Or I leave the end date. You know, uh, and that way we can say this is the what ZZZ is going to mean from January 1st, 2015, until December 31st, 2017, and then after that we'll have a separate record. Okay. Um, if it's a case disposition change, I can specify what the new disposition is. If it's a charge disposition, I can specify whether or not to dispose that charge or not. Okay. Um, again, if it was a hearing. I can specify what kind of a hearing it should be, and basically it will make those updates in line. If it was a custody type of change, then I can specify what's the new custody status, or if there's a custody flag associated with it, and I can link it to a specific agency as well. Uh, again, going through this pretty quickly, uh, and there's a lot I could cover in this, but basically this is a set of rules for how to handle an incoming message uh, of a particular type. All right. In addition, I'm not going to save that, but uh, I've got my list of custody statuses. You may want to use different ones. And so again, what we do is we set it up so that you can specify the, the custody statuses that you want to use. And you can configure how they get used. So are they used only by corrections, only you know, or used by corrections, used by DOC, um, not used, you know, or, or there are no, no restrictions on it. Uh, also, um, in the list of releases that we looked at when we saw the law enforcement portal, this is how I determine whether this custody status shows up there or not. Uh, SMS request, uh, I'm not going to talk to that uh, specifically today, but it's a nice little feature if somebody's interested in that. Um, so that's the custody statuses. So I can specify the other thing. I specify the offender status, and that's the status that shows up on the portal. So when I see, for instance, if Han Solo were, were to go to parole, if we look, parole is under supervision. So you remember when we looked up Thomas Cassell? OK. Um, let me go back to my offender notifications. Again, Thomas Cassell, remember, was in parole. So what shows up is actually the offender status. So we can kind of have a high level status. That way, if, if he's in, you know, like out at a medical or something like that, we want to track that he's there internally. But we don't want to report that. Uh, then we can basically say it's still in custody. 
Um, but that way we can receive a fee that says he's in the hospital and just not report it. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, one of the areas where we see a lot of need for configuration is with jails. Every jail has its own schema for releases. Um, and so what we do is we, we provide a way to map what their custody statuses are for each jail by their ORI to the custody statuses that we've determined. And that's a, again, it's a back-end mapping capability. It makes it a lot easier to bring on jails uh, without having to do a lot of you know, configuration at their end to try to make them match up. Okay. Uh, in addition to that, there's the other thing, the, this other final area called system values. Uh, system values essentially allow me to uh, set runtime values. So for instance, we talked about advanced releases, uh, letting somebody know when somebody's going to be getting out in X days and Y days. Well, I can configure that in here, basically saying, OK, the first notification will give 60 days out. Second notification will give when they're 30 days out. Uh, we also have what's called an imminent notification. So if somebody gets a time cut and they bypass the 60 and 30 and they're all of a sudden within 10 days, then I'll do a separate notification that's a little more urgent than a typical advanced release uh, called an imminent release, saying this guy's getting out you know, on or about such and such a day, so forth. So, and I can configure what these values are. So I can say instead of 60 and 30, I want to go with 30 and 10 with an imminent at 5. Uh, I can go in and change these, and it'll happen right in line. Uh, in addition to that, um, those of you that did register on the website, you should have gotten a uh, confirmation confirmation message saying that yes, uh, you did register. Okay, and so let me see if I can find it in here. Set register. So when you registered for an event offender, you got a message that read something like this: You've registered for notification, changing the status for the following offender, and then there's the offender name. Uh, and then how did you request notification for emergency events, urgent events, and so forth. Same thing when you were approved as a victim, you got a se separate confirmation message. Um, again, we find that sending the confirmation messages is helpful so that people know they did actually finish the process uh, and they, did, they, they are configured for notification. Okay. All right, there were a couple of other things. I see I'm kind of running over on time a little bit. Um, and so just you, I, I've kind of talk through the dashboards and, and a few other things. Um, you know, I showed you the, the, the dashboard. I can configure this dashboard to do whatever you want. So if you want to see charts or other information on here, we can do that as well. Um, so make it work specifically for how you want to see things. Uh, you also have the ability to create your own charts for personal use in line if you're a user of CRS, uh, as well as create your own data view. So each of these is a data view. Um, so if I wanted, I've already done this for the offender record, but I can create my own data view, and it'll show up in this. So you have the, what's called the system views. Those are standard views. And then I can say, I want to see all the people in the Aurora County Jail and get the list right here. Um, and then if I want, I can edit this and make it basically mine. I can share it with other people uh, so that they can use that view as well. Uh, and do my own ad hoc reporting. Thank you for attending. And if you'd like to further discuss any of the things we've looked at today or see some other things, please let me know. My name is Danny Shannon. Uh, my email address is dannys at infostrat.com.